Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful day. Thank you for waking us up this morning and giving us the strength and inclination to come to worship you today. Please be with us during our service, dear Lord. Help us to focus our love on how much you care for us and help us to transform what we hear today through our lives throughout the week. In Jesus' blessed name, amen. amen. Welcome and happy Sabbath. Let's all stand and sing uh, the hymn on page 92. I don't know the name. Thank you, Robbie. Now it's time for our prayers of praise and petition. Does anyone have any uh, prayer request or any praise? Is this for the Lord? Yes, welcome to all the visitors that are here. That is wonderful. Anybody else? Yes. If you remember my dad's prayer, he failed um, two days ago and he wanted to see us. Oh. And they done so around thankful yesterday. Okay. Anyone else? I have a praise, um, our, one of our dolls is doing a, a little, a lot better from what she was. Any more? Yes, ma'am. Oh, we're so glad to have you. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, let's everyone kneel if you can and then we'll have a prayer. 
<clears throat> Dear Father, we come to you today with our hearts so grateful and full of praise for you. Dear Lord, we lift up to you all the prayer requests that have come across, dear Father, and even those that are unspoken. Um, please be with Emily. We pray for healing of her, dear Jesus, and we're thankful that Kim is here and, and the other lady and Robert's mother is here with us today. Please be with those that are traveling and at the elders' retreat. Pray for healing for Kim's father, and please be with all those that are caring for him. Um, and for Serena's school, dear Father, we pray that they are able to get the technologies that they need to help them in their education. And please be with Denise's eye. Please remove whatever is causing her to have that problem. Pray for healing. Dear Jesus, we thank you. You are, you are the great physician. And we love you and we thank you. And we lift all these people up to you and more. And we praise you for all that, would, that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath. It is now time to take up our tithes and offering. Will the ushers please come forward?
Father God, thank you that we do have life because you live. We can never give enough, Father, to match what you have given us in the creation, in our homes, in our food, in our family, in our health, Father, in our very life. We just thank you that we have this opportunity to give back what, what you've given us. And Lord, we ask that you will bless it and that it will be used to bring your kingdom here on earth very soon. We love you and thank you for this Sabbath day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
thank you, Rob, for the beautiful story. Yeah, it's, it's not easy getting mowed, but when we get mowed, it's only, not only God feel happy, but we feel happy too. It's much better for us when we mold by God's hands. And today we're going to be blessed with another special music. We have Rob's special music, which was so beautiful. And now Melanie is going to give her another uh, special music. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Sometimes you gotta find the strength to rise from the ashes and make a new beginning. Anyone can feel the ache, you think it's more than you can take, but you're stronger, stronger than you know. Don't you give up now? The sun will soon be shining You gotta face the clouds To find the silver lining I've seen dreams that move the mountains Hope that doesn't ever end Even when the sky is falling I've seen miracles just happen Silent prayers get answered Broken hearts become brand new That's what faith can do It doesn't matter what you've heard Impossible is not a word It's just a reason For someone not to try Everybody's scared to Decide to take that step out on the water, but it'll be alright. Life is so much more than what your eyes are seeing. You will find your way if you keep believing. I've seen dreams that move the mountains, hope that doesn't end. with me in Matthew, the sixth chapter, verses 26 through 31. 
Matthew 6, 26 through 31. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet their heavenly Father feeds them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall for he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall I eat, or what shall I drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Don't you just love spring? <laughs> Yesterday was spring anyway. I'm not quite sure about today. <laughs> it's such a happy time. There's something so cheerful about the warmer days until today, the budding flowers and the return of so many different birds into the area. When I look about me, I'm astounded at the amazing artistry that God exhibits in the creation of our world, the incredible variety of flowers in dazzling colors, the busy little bees darting around on their pollen gathering missions, the bright butterflies darting from bush to bush, brightening up the landscape, the wonderful fragrances of lilacs, hyacinths, and roses, and the birds. Those of you who are my friends on Facebook know that I'm bonkers about birds. I'm constantly amazed at the variety and brilliant colors exhibited throughout the bird world. I ask myself, who besides God could have fashioned their brilliant plumage and beautiful songs? I've borrowed a few, in fact quite a few, pictures from Facebook of these beautiful winged ambassadors of God's love and creativity to show on the screen behind me while I'm speaking in hopes that they will remind you of God's love for you and the beautiful world he's created for his children. I've always loved birds. As a small child, several times I tried to rescue a baby bird fallen from the nest and would even go out and dig up worms to feed them. Now this was true dedication because I was a very fussy, feminine little girl and I hated and still disliked strongly anything creepy crawly, but I went out and dug up worms. One spring when I was about 10, a sparrow built a nest in the trellis outside my parents' bedroom and I kept a constant watch on the comings and goings of the parent birds. I watched as they built their nest carefully and peeked in at the little eggs after they were laid. And I checked on the baby birds several times a day as they grew from featherless little blobs with large beaks to fully feathered baby birds. I was very protective of that nest and felt like these wild creatures were my special pets. Now, I've always loved pets, but my mother had asthma and all sorts of allergies, so cats and dogs were out as far as pets were concerned. But when I was 11 years old, I got my first real pet as a Christmas gift. My little brother, who was so excited because he knew about the surprise, blurted out before Christmas. He said, Carolee, we got you a bird, and it's in the closet. <laughs> And when I first saw my bird very early Christmas morning, I was totally in love. Pretty Baby was a sweet, gentle bird, and he was a great companion to me during my preteen years. He'd sit on my shoulder for hours, and I would talk to him just like he was a human. Now, he wasn't the most precocious bird that ever was, 
and his only verbal accomplishment in the years that we had it was to learn to say pretty baby and pretty bird. And he really did seem to be convinced that he was the prettiest bird ever. He looked at his reflection in everything shiny. And in my mother's house, everything that could be shiny was very shiny. <laughs> and constantly reaffirmed to himself that he was indeed a pretty bird. He apparently did not have any problem with a positive self-image. A few years later, we acquired a second parakeet named Pretty Boy. You can see we weren't real imaginative with our names. <laughs> PB, as we sometimes called him, was as outgoing and aggressive as Pretty Baby was sweet and quiet. He was a quick learner and could say any number of phrases. I'm firmly convinced he didn't know he was a bird, however. He thought he was a small person with wings. He seemed to understand us when we talked to him and only used his cage for sleeping and eating. He spent most of the day riding on my mother's shoulder, chattering happily in her ear as she worked around the house. When he died, it was like losing a member of the family. By then, I was hooked on birds as pets. They were pretty, cheerful creatures who seemed to enjoy human companionship. They were seldom grumpy, unless you happen to forget to cover their cages at night. And they started each day with a cheerful song. And when you think about it, we do well to start our day the same way. During my teen years and early married life, I had a number of pet parakeets and have given birds as pets to my grandchildren. And it always brightened my day to hear their cheerful song and friendly interaction. Since my chosen house pets are now four-legged furry creatures, I no longer have a bird inside my house. I still adore parakeets, and once Birdie sat Cheerio, the cook's precious parakeet. My dogs barked at him so much that weekend that I was sure when he returned home, he would be barking in the pastor's ear. While I may not have birds inside my house any longer, I thoroughly enjoy the wild birds that visit my feeders. A number of years ago, Billy added a screened-in porch to the back of our house, and my girls gave me several bird feeders for my birthday. We created what we call my sanctuary. My children and grandchildren helped me plant flower bulbs, and we put out a couple of comfy chairs and a swing, and I can sit out there and watch and listen to the birds to my heart's content. And there's nothing quite so calming to me as the background of bird song and the bright spots of color darting through the holly trees near the feeders. I have cardinals, woodpeckers, goldfinches, and doves who regularly visit the feeder, in addition to sparrows, Carolina chickadees, tufted titmice, and the beautiful hummingbirds, who's, and a lot of birds that I haven't identified yet. When I was in grade school, I particularly enjoyed our morning worship and the singing time we had at the beginning of each school day. And whenever I got to pick a song, it was generally number 186 in the old youth songbook, Singing Youth, entitled, God Cares for Me. And I'd like to share those words with you today. Oh, the lark sings in the meadow, in the pleasant flowery meadow, and a happy song sings he. And the burden of his trilling, all the air with music filling, it is this, God cares for me. God cares for me, bright as the day before me. Where'er I go, right well I know, his loving care is o'er me. Oh, the thrush sings in the greenwood, in the cool and shady greenwood, and a happy song sings he. Perched upon a bough so slender, hear him sing in accents tender. Oh, he cares, he cares for me. Let us join them in their singing, in their clear and constant singing. Who should be as glad as we? For our Father up in heaven has to us his own word given saying, child, I care for thee. As I've been pondering what to talk about today, the words to this little childhood song have been whirring through my brain. 
And I realize that I personally sometimes need reminding how much God does care for me. As I look over the congregation today, I doubt there are very few families who haven't had some sort of disaster in their lives at one time or another. We've battled serious illnesses, endured difficult medical treatments, and lost loved ones to death. We've faced financial diff problems and personal difficulties with friends and family. At times, we've been misunderstood, unappreciated, and felt down in the dumps and unloved. It sometimes seems as if we can't get through one crisis before another one's upon us. We often feel lonely, depressed, and believe that we've been forgotten by just about everybody. During the latter part of 2002, I was dealing with my own dark blue funk, a time when it seemed that there was a big black rain cloud permanently stationed above my head, and the only news I heard was bad news. I couldn't concentrate on much, and the things I used to enjoy had lost their appeal. In September of 2002, I was diagnosed with breast cancer that had spread to the lymph nodes the same awful disease that had taken the life of my best friend a few years earlier. Several weeks after my diagnosis, my precious son-in-law, who'd been feeling unusually tired, was diagnosed with cancer also. Between the two of us, we spent a lot of time running back and forth to UNC Cancer Center. Between the frightening aspect of the illness and the grueling chemotherapy and radiation treatments, it was difficult to feel very cheerful. But when things really got me down, the words and tune of that little childhood song, God Cares for Me, kept coming back to me and gave me encouragement. It reminded me that regardless of my current circumstances, God did care for me in a special way. During those times when I felt I was really beat, I spent a lot of time in my little sanctuary, gaining comfort from the beauty around me. And those were some of the most relaxing days that I can remember. And I thought that maybe some folks today need reminding how much God cares for them. Even when our personal roof caves in and our problems seem insurmountable. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 tells us, Casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. This means that God cares for me when I'm sick. God cares for me when I'm scared. God cares for me when I'm sad. God cares for me when I'm discouraged and feel like giving up. God cares for me when I feel lonely and forgotten. God cares for me when I fail him and make mistakes. God cares for me when people misunderstand me and talk about me. God never takes a holiday from caring about me. The scripture tells us in Luke 23, verses 6 to 7 and verse 24, Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you're of more value than many sparrows. God is concerned about the welfare of the lowly sparrow. Now, the sparrow is not a brilliant, outstandingly beautiful bird, just an ordinary, small, feathered creature. There's lots of them everywhere, but God is concerned for the welfare of each of them. And if God is concerned about such a small, insignificant bird, just imagine how concerned he is for us, his children created in his image. We are also told in the same passage that God loves us so much that he has numbered the hairs on our head. When you're losing your hair in clumps due to chemotherapy, that promise takes on heightened significance. To realize that God is so intimately caring about us that he counts the constantly changing number of hairs on our head, I feel that gives us courage. While I was dealing with my health issues, Missy gave me a book entitled A Bend in the Road by David Jeremiah. It's basically the story of the author's battle with lymphoma 
and how it affected his relationship with God and how he learned through his illness to praise the Lord even during the bad times. We all have bad times and we all feel weak and helpless at some point in our lives. Finding out that I had cancer made me feel weak, scared and helpless, not to mention teary and depressed. The day I got the official bad news, I was a basket case. And if there's one thing my husband can't stand, it's a weepy wife. He called a pastor friend's wife, and she called her husband, who was away from home at the time. He immediately called me, and we talked for a while. But the main thing I remember him telling me over and over was hold tight to Jesus. Hold tight to Jesus' hand. He didn't tell me I would be well. He didn't tell me I shouldn't be scared. He didn't mention that I'd end up bald, but he simply told me, hold tight to Jesus. And you know, when you think about it, that's the most important thing any of us can do when we're assaulted by problems. When our world turns upside down and we feel that we're at the end of the rope, when we are at our weakest, God is his strongest. And if we'll just hold tight to his hand, He's promised to see us through whatever crisis we're facing. Now, becoming a Christian doesn't mean we're going to be immune from the problems in life, as I'm sure you all know by now. It isn't a guarantee that we'll always be healthy, wealthy, and wise. We may do all the right things, eat all the right foods, exercise daily, read the right books, and still have problems, illnesses, and losses. The story of Job is a classic example of somebody getting an unfair dose of disaster. According to the scriptures, Job was a godly man, a man who brought his children up to love the Lord, a good neighbor and a friend to God. And God had blessed him for many years, but in no time at all, everything changed. He lost his family, his fortune, and eventually his health. It wasn't his fault. He hadn't done anything wrong but he suffered anyway. Despite the horrible things happening to Job, he trusted God to take care of him. And in time, God restored his health and wealth. The Bible clearly shows that bad things do happen to good people. But when these bad things happen, God doesn't desert us. He may not always relieve us of our burdens, but he always offers to share them and impart his strength to us. King David is another example of a man who had his share of troubles. David Jeremiah in his book, A Bend in the Road, says, if such a thing as an honorary doctorate in crises and catastrophes had existed, David would have been awarded one. Although he was a man after God's own heart, his life was one long procession of problems. As we see from the scriptural account of his life, he spent years fleeing from the wrath of a king living as a fugitive, hiding and sleeping in caves. When he finally did become king, he immediately had to deal with geopolitical crises on every front. His nation of Israel was at war with everyone in sight. David coped. He calmed the waters as best he could. And when everything has settled down on the political front, that's when the domestic exploded. He was like a man whose career finally begins to look promising, and then his sons get in trouble with the police. David's own sons were in open rebellion against him. The house of David was crumbling. There were cracks in the foundation. David walked in the midst of trouble. He made terrible, fateful mistakes, yet he always remained one of God's favorite children. Throughout all his difficulties, David continued to praise God. We all probably know by memory the 23rd Psalm, better known as the Shepherd's Psalm, where he paints a beautiful word picture of the shepherd guarding his sheep. Through his beautiful poetry, we can glimpse David's faith and trust in a protecting God. And the strength and confidence that David expresses, it's still available for us today. It seems like the tougher things got for David, the more he praised God. I believe there's a lesson in that for us today. Whether your life is currently in crisis or not, 
it's important to take time to praise God. Praise elevates our thoughts from ourselves. It takes our minds off our problems, our disasters, and helps us focus on God and his goodness. While God wants us to bring his concerns to him, it's also important for us to remember his goodness to us. I'm afraid that often my prayers consist primarily of a long list of, Dear Lord, please help. Kind of like driving a pickup load of problems and dumping it at his, them at his feet without taking the time to acknowledge his greatness, his love for us, and his holiness. I've been trying to take more time to count my blessings lately, and it's amazing what praise to God can do for your outlook on life. When you're feeling down, get a pad of paper and start just listing the blessings that God has bestowed on you over the years. Or if you're stuck in traffic, take the time to thank God for getting you up that morning and protecting and caring for you. And you will be amazed at how much better you'll feel when you remind yourself how much God truly does care for you. David Jeremiah continues, every believer knows that when we walk through the valley of tears, God walks beside us. When we pass through the fire, he draws close to deflect the flames. When we wade through the flood, he is nearby to keep our hands up. In the storm or in the earthquakes or in the midst of any disaster threatening to engulf us, that's the time we feel the presence of the Lord as we've never felt him before. God is closest in the crises, surrounding us with his presence. He promised us he would do it, and our Lord is always as good as his word. David reminds us in Psalms 28, 7, the Lord is my strength and my shield and my heart trusts in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices and my, with my song will I praise him. Sometimes when we're going through crises in our lives, we may think that God has forsaken us, maybe scratched us from his daily planner but he never abandons his people. I asked God for patience. God said, no. Patience is a byproduct of tribulations. It isn't granted, it's earned. I asked God to give me happiness. God said, no. Suffering draws you apart from worldly cares and brings you close to me. I asked God to make my spirit grow. God said, no, you must grow up on your own, but I will prune you to make you fruitful. I asked God for all things that I might enjoy life. God said, no, I will give you life so that you may enjoy all things. I asked God to help me love others. As much as God loves me, God said, ah, oh, you finally got the idea. <laughs> Stop telling God how big your storm is. It's time to tell your storm how big your God is. Indeed, we do have a big God, a God who can be trusted to provide the strength we need each day, a God who cares when we're hurting, who comforts us when we're sad, who helps us to grow closer to him in times of crisis. And as we lean on God's strength, we grow spiritually. When we admit our weaknesses and inability to cope, God is ready to step in and lend us his boundless strength. In Ellen White's writings, there's a quote that I think of often, and it goes something like this. We have nothing to fear for the future, except that we forget the way that God has led us in the past. No matter what obstacles Satan may place in your path, no matter what heartaches you may have, remember how God has led you in the past and that he will know that he'll continue to guide your steps in the future. He cares about you and is anxious and willing to stand by your side at all times, under all circumstances. Matthew 23, 27 says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, 
you that kill the prophets and stone them which are sent to you. How often would I have gathered your children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not. I was raised a city girl, so I had little experience with chickens when I moved from Washington, D.C. to Pittsburgh. But when my girls were little, my in-laws had some chickens. And it was fun to watch the little biddies scurry under their mother's wings when threatened, usually by one of my children. When we would approach, no matter where the little chicks were exploring in the pen, when the mother hen called them, they dashed for cover under her sheltering wings. And I like the picture that paints of God wanting to shelter and protect us if we'll only listen to his call. In the year 1919, which happens to be the year my mother was born, Annie Johnson Flynn and William M. Runyon wrote a song that I've always loved entitled, What God Hath Promised. I could initially only remember the chorus, but I got to digging through my collection of thrift store hymnals, and I finally found the whole song. God hath not promised skies always blue, flowers strewn pathways all our lives through. God hath not promised sun without rain, joy without sorrow, peace without pain. God hath not promised we shall not know toil and temptation, trouble and woe. He hath not told us we shall not bear many a burden, many a care. God hath not promised smooth roads and wide, swift, easy travel, needing no guide. Never a mountain rocky and steep, never a river turbid and deep. But God hath promised strength for the day, rest for the labor, light for the way, grace for our trials, help for above, unfailing sympathy, sympathy, undying love. Life in this sinful world isn't fair. It isn't always easy. It's a battle between Christ and Satan, and Satan is doing his best to destroy our health happiness, security, and faith. But all this is temporary. We know who's going to win the battle. We know which leader is the strongest. It's sort of like being able to read the last chapter in a thrilling novel and knowing what the ultimate, ultimate outcome will be. In the closing pages of the book, The Great Right Controversy, Ellen White, in talking about the New Jerusalem, gives this beautiful description. Pain cannot exist in heaven. There will be no more tears, no funeral trains. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, for the former things are passed away. The inhabitants shall not say, I am sick. There will be no more weariness. We shall ever feel the freshness of the morning and ever be far from its close. The light of the sun will be superseded by a radiance which is not painfully dazzling, yes, yet which immeasurably surpasses the brightness of our noontide. The redeemed walk in the glory of the perpetual day. The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinner are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things, animate and inanimate, in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy, declare that God is love. What a beautiful word picture that paints, and what a wonderful goal to press toward. The most beautiful sights here on earth and there are some exquisitely beautiful things to see in this world, will pale in comparison to the glories of heaven. I can't begin to imagine the spectacular birds and flowers that will never die, that are waiting for us. So when troubles come, remember the little birds and how God cares for them, and remember to thank him for loving and caring for you each day. Please turn in your hymnals to hymn number 529. <coughs> okay. 
This hymn reminds me of a chicken. <laughs> to enjoy your wonderful beauties of the creation and help us to realize that all you have done for us shows how much you care for us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad you decided to join us, and I'd just like to invite you to come again sometime. Whether you watch us online, or whether you decided to come and join with us next week. Of course, I realize you may be far away, and that won't be possible. But that's okay, you can still contact us, whether you're near or far away. Feel free to give me a text, or an email, or a phone call. My phone and texting number is 336-963. 5012. Make sure you put your name in there because I probably won't know who you are otherwise. And you can also email me at djcook28 at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. If you're interested in a pastoral visit or a Bible study on a particular topic, I would love to meet with you and spend some time to go over that topic with you. And thanks again for joining us. Let me just say a quick prayer with you as we wrap up our time together today. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your Holy Spirit and for how he draws us together even when we're miles apart. Just ask that uh, through this week uh, you'll watch over us and bring us safely back together again next week so that we can worship you in, in holiness and in the, the righteousness provided.
to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. In his name.